All right, the room is filling up. Welcome everyone. I'm Raquel Gutierrez and I will be moderating our panel this morning. We're gonna get a jump start. So I'm here in Tucson, Arizona with uh, Allison Gross he, there in Wisconsin, Madison, Maria Sherman in Brooklyn and Brittany Spanos in Brooklyn as well, correct Brittany? Yeah. Fantastic. So. Um, this is day five, right, of our PopCon 2020, Wednesday, September 23rd. So we are here for their bodies, ourselves, faith, sex, and politics in pop. So we're going to go ahead and begin with Allison Gross, who is presenting You Can't Take My Youth Away, Pop Stars and Political Representation in the Trump Era. So um, you'll have 10 minutes, Allison. All right, thank you. Start sharing my screen. That look good? That looks great. Great. So over the course of the last four years, the role of celebrity political expression has been an increasing point of public discussion. While the question of if and how celebrities might use their platforms for good has always been a salient one, the Trump administration, the climate crisis, and the movement for Black Lives have shifted debate around political inaction. What are celebrities actually doing and what is it that we really want from them? Back in January, I pitched this presentation to look at the rhetorical vagueness of pop star politics and the fans who pushed them to do better. Since then, a bit has changed. Uh, in the wake of the summer's uprisings against the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, everyone from Ariana Grande to Halsey, Shawn Mendes, and Harry Styles took to the streets. In a piece on pop stars as political organizers, Jason King wrote in Pitchfork that they were, quote, increasingly offering concrete proposals instead of stale inspirational rhetoric. And just this week, public voters in the New York Times' What is Celebrity Package ranked pop star protesters as the third most relevant type of celebrity. While these pop star protesters have been lauded for plugging in or showing up this summer, I'm interested in chatting today a little bit about the ways they have, in the last few years, rhetorically expanded their fandom's ethical frameworks to include acts of citizenship. So here I'm borrowing language from Dr. Ashley Hanks' excellent book, Politics for the Love of Fandom, to apply the process of pairing popular culture ethical frameworks with civic ethical modalities in pop music. By this, I mean to ask how have some of pop music's biggest stars navigated their own political expression and how have they deployed those politics for fan engagement? For the sake of time, I'm gonna talk about two artists which provide varying examples, Taylor Swift and Shawn Mendes. Specifically, I'm going to look at public statements, voter registration and charity slash foundation work that each have participated in or started over the last three years to examine how pop stars rhetorically invite fans, particularly young fans, to participate in political activity. So I'll start with Taylor Swift, whose political trajectory requires a bit less introduction. So as has been well covered, Taylor's 12 year reticence to speak out about her own politics ended in 2018 when she endorsed two Democrats running for Congress in Tennessee. In the Instagram post that did it, Taylor outlined her own progressive values and called on her fans, specifically the many intelligent, thoughtful, and self-possessed people who had turned 18 in the two years since the 2016 election to register to vote on vote.org. In subsequent political acts, Taylor started and chaired a petition for the Equality Act, publicly called on the Tennessee Historical Commission to take down Confederate monuments, and tweeted angrily at and about Donald Trump. Of course, a lot could be and has been said about the particular rhetoric that Swift uses to to describe her political beliefs and the variety of ways she constitutes her fans as audience within these calls to action. But on a very basic level, the most interesting thing about Swift's political performance is the relative normality of her using her platform. Starting petitions and posting about them online is an extremely low bar, well-meaning liberal white woman thing to do. Yet it's also one of the most explicitly simple and invitational performances of politics among pop's elite. By posting her own examples and linking fans to easy ways to participate in civic action, Taylor has repeatedly expanded the ethical framework of her fandom to include these acts of citizenship. While a lot of this expansion may be predicated on the fact that deep fandom is rooted in identification with the star, Taylor's embedding of this material within fandom practice further does this work. So one prime example of this is in her Equality Act open letter Instagram post, in which Taylor said that she would be looking for fans' letters to senators under the hashtag letter to my senator. Here we have an example from Audrey, who wrote her first letter to Ted Cruz uh, based on the example that Taylor set. So in this instance, Taylor's attention online, which is a primary goal of many fans, becomes tied to one's public performance of civic activity. Taylor Swift wants in this moment, being a Taylor Swift fan, to mean speaking up about politics. She demonstrates this further in her 2019 release, the song Only the Young, which accompanied the documentary Miss Americana, which further detailed the behind the scenes of Taylor's own political awakening. 
The song exhorts young people fearful of the big bad man and his big bad clan to run, presumably for office. If only the young can save us, as Swift sings, she believes they'll do so through participating in mainstream performances of democratic engagement. So in 2019, Sean Mendez wrote for Time that Taylor makes anyone older feel young again and anyone young feel like they can do anything. This is, he says, the one thing he wants to achieve in his career over anything else. This is also the mission of the Sean Mendez Foundation, started that same year, founded with the intent to give a voice to the youth generation of today. The foundation says they'll empower Sean's audience to create change they want to see and encourages fans to tell Sean and the team what causes that they want to see action taken on. This isn't Sean's first foray into youth empowerment. Sean wrote Youth, the third single from his 2018 self-titled, in the wake of the Manchester Arena bombing and performed the song at the 2018 Billboard Awards with survivors of the Parkland shooting. Like only the young, youth reinforces the power of young people whose potential can't or won't be diminished by fear of the world around them. While Swift's politics provide explicitly civic modes of engagement for her fans, the Sean Mendes Foundation functions as a mouthpiece for the issues that Sean and his fans care about. In a September 2019 interview, Sean said, the whole thing about the foundation is creating a platform for people to go onto the website and be like, I wanna help three, four, five, six different causes. We don't wanna tackle just one problem, Sean said, because there are too many. But rather than providing fans the opportunity to participate in civic activity or do anything about these problems themselves, Mendez and the foundation function as representative stop gaps instead. Fan participation in the Sean Mendez Foundation is primarily oriented around donating money through the website and upon giving money, selecting an issue you're passionate about to help them determine future campaigns. So options listed for future campaigns on uh, the donation website include anti-bullying, children's health care, education, human rights, mental health, sustainability, and the vaguely named youth empowerment. You can only choose one issue per donation or write the cause you care about in the other chat box. While the Sean Mendes Foundation expands the ethical framework of the Sean Mendes fandom to include political engagement, it does so through promoting the foundation's potential to speak for fans, not for fans to speak for themselves. The website's Our Work page directs to its Instagram, which posts about issues like Black Lives Matter, directs fans to other organizations to research and updates followers about current events in the same recently popularized Instagram political graphic style seen all across the platform this summer. In the comments of many of the posts, some fans have critiqued the fact that this work is siloed to the foundation's page instead of shown on Sean's personal account, which has millions more followers. And fans who follow the foundation's account are also the same people who might participate in or already be aware of the foundation's mission in the first place. So in this way, the Sean Mendes Foundation provides a closed loop of political awareness. While Taylor's civic action is directed outward, young Sean Mendes fans donate their own money to, re to be redistributed to preset causes amplified on Instagram right back to them. There are, of course, myriad other ways for celebrities to engage politically. Ariana Grande's Sweetener Tour in 2018 registered more than 33,000 fans to vote. Billie Eilish has repeatedly spoken up about the climate crisis, um, from encouraging fans to participate in the youth climate strike, to wearing a no music on a dead planet t-shirt uh, while performing at last year's American Music Awards. And Harry Styles' Treat People with Kindness initiative raised $1.2 million to be distributed at organizations, fighting a variety of progressive causes in each of the cities he visited across his 2018 tour. Each of these artists have used their platforms to bring attention to social justice work, provided opportunities for their fans to plug in or funnel money toward political organizations. My intention in focusing on Sean and Taylor is to highlight two differing but representative strategies employed by pop stars for fan political engagement. Pop stars are increasingly expanding what it means to be a fan of theirs to include civic action and political awareness. What strategies they use to do so and how directly they empower young fans differs with varying rates of success. By publicizing her own politics for fans and providing opportunities for them to get involved, Taylor Swift expands what it means to be a fan of hers to include civic activity like writing one senators or registering to vote. More indirect modes of political expression like the Sean Mendez Foundation attempt to represent fans values for them and amplify and fund progressive causes. But the context in which these forms of political engagement arise and are sustained are fraught with contested meaning. So that Taylor is even politically active now at all is a testament to both the potential consequences and the transforming expectations of celebrity political expression. Still, fans continue to challenge their favorite artists to be more explicit about their politics. Throughout 2017 and 2018, Harry Styles fans brought Black Lives Matter signs to shows around the US and Europe in an attempt to push Styles to say the words Black Lives Matter themselves. This summer, Open Your Purse, 
became a dissatisfied refrain thrown at celebrities unwilling to do more than repost black squares on Instagram. And just yesterday, Shawn Mendes fans in Brazil spammed the foundation's Twitter account in an attempt to alert them to and build awareness for the fires currently destroying Brazil's largest wetland. The pop fandom political landscape is not one of unidirectional influence from start a fan, but a contested discursive space of representation, identification, and action. That fans should, speak, uh, should seek political support from their favorite pop stars, and that stars themselves are routinely building these performances of civic action into their public facing work speaks to the shifting expectations of what it means to use one's platform in 2020. To shut up and sing is no longer an option. Thank you. All right, thank you, Allison. That was great. I actually felt my cortisol levels like minimize. I feel, I feel a little more positive these days. I mean, or these, this minute. <laughs> um, next up, we will have Maria Sherman on her presentation can't have you, Christianity, virginity, and the purity movement in the aughts youth. That's how I say zero zeros. Great, yeah. Um, I am a little bit nervous that this will bring the mood down slightly, <laughs> uh, but here we go. Uh, hey, everybody. Um, so in doing research, can you see everything fine? I guess, okay, great. Um, so in doing research for my book, Larger Than Life, A History of Boy Bands, I was struck by how deeply boy bands reflected the prevailing sociopolitical identity of each era they exist or existed in. And I think Allison's paper really touched on that in a direct way. Uh, teen pop acts can mirror societal values, also markedly to sell product and ideology with varying degrees of success. An egregious example of this is the purity movement of the mid to late 2000s, when the Jonas Brothers, three sons of a New Jersey preacher, became the poster children for a Christian branded teenage virginity, alongside their fellow purity ring wearing Disney Channel stars, Selena Gomez, Demi Lovato, Miley Cyrus, there were so many of them. A uh, decade after Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera, and Justin Timberlake promoted the same belief beliefs, and before they individuated through their own personal exploration of mature themes, autonomy pronounced in healthy overt sexuality, and also justified still bangs. My book breaks that down a little bit, and my coworker at Jezebel, Hazel Sills, wrote a deep dive into the relationship between teen pop and the purity movement, establishing how perfectly it overlapped with President George W. Bush's community-based abstinence education program, peddling abstinence-only sex ed into American public schools, while teen heartthrobs on TV and radio did the same thing, a bombardment, a perfect mirror, allowing conservative Christians to maintain political power in pop culture spaces and in schools, and like a great time to be confused about your body and its ownership. Um, but my interest here, and this is sort of a deviation of that and some work in progress thinking, is exploring the relationship between Christianity and youth music that has been covered less in relation to the purity movement of the 2000s, but existed concurrently. Third wave emo, pop punk, post hardcore, the hot topic stuff that airs in emo nights across the country, uh, music that was frequently perceived by its listeners to be an alternative to mainstream teen pop and its morals, and yet routinely occupied those same mainstream spaces, um, I think one of the reasons the Jonas Brothers worked in 2006 and onward, a pop rock boy band built of instrumentalists, when so few post Beatles boy bands picked up guitars was that they were the sort of PG version of a PG-13 emo band on MTV's TRL and elsewhere. The My Chemical Romances and Panic at the Discos of the World. Uh, those were groups whose vaudevillian performance style involved wearing guy liner and women's skinny jeans, male members kissed one another, um, metrosexual language was still in vogue. Bodily sexuality was sold on stage through a queered, and I want to make this clear, it's an appropriative and often disingenuous queerness, but still meant to be read as sort of homoerotic performance style that appealed to young people, in particular young women, and directly challenged the sort of virginal peer groups on Disney, though loving all that music wasn't mutually exclusive. Um, of course, unlike the Jonas Brothers, those secular groups were perceived as threatening to an evangelical status quo and to an extent abstinence language, a result of the moral panic surrounding emo's apparent effeminizing and vulgar effects, uh, even though emo possesses a total lack of sexual maturity um, and wasn't particularly threatening in that way, except for maybe the fact that they didn't wear purity rings and their sexuality, if present, was obsessed with not having sex with someone you really want to have sex with, which is uh, an idea that I will return to. Um, among a variety of reasons, marketing for one, I believe that because there was an absence of the sort of explicit sex conversation partnered with an inability for like tweens to read sex and song, um, an emo, wholesome Christian emo and pop punk was able to thrive alongside it, hiding in plain view, giving way to the youth group attending bands like Under Oath, Pedro the Lion, Reliant K and Flyleaf, as pictured above, they look just like secular emo groups, giving way to the, um, I'm sorry, um, 
giving weight to the youth group attending bands like Under Us, Fader Line, Rayline, K Fly. We act signed to cool Christian rock labels like Solid State and Tooth and Nail Records, acts that sold millions of records in and outside of the church which is not very common. Christian rock music is typically enjoyed by Christians, sort of exclusively. Um, but with Christian emo, it was common for listeners to fail to recognize that these artists even had a religious agenda or even identify them as singing about Jesus. And that was an intentional coding. Christian religiosity found a way to sort of seamlessly enter the secular emo fold. And they did so by borrowing some of the tools those teen pop stars used to perpetuate their abstinence message through symbols of Christian chastity without making theology explicit. You can thank God, you can say I'm saving myself, you can pull Jessica Simpson and say I'm so glad I didn't lose my virginity in the back of a Jeep, and that's sort of the extent of it. Um, John Jeremiah Sullivan lays out those tools in his 2004 GQ Creation Festival feature. He writes, Christian rock is a genre that exists to edify and make money off of evangelical Christians. A Christian band, on the other hand, is just a band that has one or has more than one Christian in it. In most cases, bands like these make a very, very careful effort not to be seen as playing Christian rock. It's a matter of phrasing. Don't tell the interviewer you're born again. Say faith is an important part of your life. Nowadays, you see it more as like spirituality in place of faith. Um, the emo and pop punk groups of the purity movement period did the same, avoiding Christian band, the, Christ, the label of Christian bands as a whole and benefiting from playing music deemed cool to most of the country and certainly was the popular alternative form of music for white suburban youth. I think an emo and pop punk as on the Disney channel, whiteness equated to purity and purity to a sort of virginal godliness. And I think Britney's paper will maybe touch upon that. Um, for example, Flyleaf and Reliant K were viewed as just another emo band in the scene, as you can tell in these pretty silly tweets. Um, they played the same festivals and were included on the same compilations. The musical style too didn't sting with the same kind of contempt held for much Christian rock music. It had an excellent proof to itself, another phrase from Sullivan. It was objectively interesting enough to attract listeners outside of church because it was a musical genre already like accepted outside of church. Um, that not only worked to introduce Christian music and conservative messaging into a secular space like MySpace or the Vans Warped Tour, where private par um, prayer circles became prevalent, emo music could exist in youth group, becoming a routine after school activity for Christian kids and their agnostic friends who are already being fed abstinence only education in school. I like to think that this is almost a joke now, but I remember in my youth, you would like meet a kid who had cool bangs, he'd invite you to a group hang, and then on a Wednesday evening, you find yourself in the basement of a church eating stale cookies while he plays Further Seem Forever covers on acoustic guitar, and then tells you to go to some camp. Um, and, and this was so popular because church, fi church figures found a way to teach emo evangelism alongside scripture. Emo music is one avenue through which God can begin or continue a process of healing through connectedness, sharing, and understanding. Aaron P. Anastasi, a high school music director in Allentown, New Jersey, wrote in 2005 for the Journal of Religion and Health, emo music can offer an environment for suffering individual, uh, the suffering individual to begin to think about and develop a vocabulary to describe their pain. In some cases, music can serve as prayer of faith for the adolescent, allowing him to connect with God. It's worth mentioning, this is a really like sort of antiquated gender reading of emo. Obviously, third wave emo is performed primarily by white men, but it was enjoyed heavily by a female audience um, who was written off as enjoying hysterical music in conjunction with that gendering, the sort of language of it becomes, it truly becomes emotional music then. Um, but it can also tell us about how emotional music was actually taught in youth group. Erin Hahn, author of Alternative Christian YA, wrote in 2018 about her time co-leading a high school girl's Bible study with another mom in the mid 2000s who spent the entire time just sort of terrifying women with um, by demonizing premarital sex and showing them horrible anti-abortion imagery. She lectured and terrified and accused these young girls. I was furious. All I could think was that if one, what if one of these girls had premarital sex? That is a normal desire for a hu hormonal human being, she wrote. But more than that, I remember getting into the car that night with my husband who led the boys group and was like, you talked about what? We just prayed and listened to Skillet. Outside of the explicitly Christian groups, many secular bands occupied a space of identity for fans and took the place of, the, of religion as well. It's common to hear a third wave emo fan say a band saved their life, which I think still continues to this day. The way Christians say they were saved by Jesus Christ, um, the language is consistent and so are the themes, grief, hopelessness. The danger for parents hoping to deliver Christian messaging to their children at the time through emo and purity, however, is that emo is written through transients. Emo and pop punk is a phase, virginity, for most adults is also a phase. Does religion and Christianity too become a phase if it is tethered to an adolescent interest? And for some of these like explicitly Christian emo bands, it did. Under Oath has spent the last couple of years being very 
militant and vocal about um, leaving the Catholic Church. Um, vocalist Spencer Chamberlain even told Revolver that if he was still a Christian, he'd probably be dead from a lack of support. There are other ways secular emo and pop punk in opposition to the purity ring wearing teen pop star occupied a space of religiosity for its non religious fans while introducing Christian themes. For example, the music flirted with Catholic iconography and rarely did so with any notable bastardization of it, like unlike in hardcore where you would see like inverted crosses or some sort of distortion of that imagery. Um, that could be for fear of isolating an audience or an example of Christian uh, commercialism or out of respect for their own religion. I think My Chemical Romance is a great example of this. Um, as you can see, there's frontman Gerard Way wearing a clerical collar and holding a Bible. Um, and in the middle image, it's the, taken from the music video for Helena. He has prayer hands up, also as an Italian-American in New Jersey, probably raised Catholic. Um, and even in their comeback imagery, which is on the far side, they opted for a cross flurry, which fans took to symbolize the Holy Trinity and the resurrection of Christ. Uh, sort of continuing with them as an example, sex infrequently crops up in My Chemical Romance's lyricism, and if it does, it's sort of opaque or fictionalized or isn't the main narrative. Uh, when I spoke to Gerard Way in 2014, after the band had disbanded, he said he lacked the maturity to discuss sex and song. Obviously, consistency throughout the genre when the purity movement prevailed. Um, but where purity does, in some form, crop up in mid 2000s secular emo is in its obsession to an inaccessibility to sex. I promised I would return to that. As opposed to those teen pop stars who expressed an open willingness to participate in a virginity narrative in interviews and with their rings. And a lot of this probably goes into emo masculinity, and maybe we'll talk about that in the Q&A. But unlike the traditional image of the rock star preoccupied with getting some, emo is about getting none. Sexual frustration that now kind of strikes me as horrifyingly incel adjacent, but at the time was viewed as like fictionalized, innocuous celibacy for boys who fancied themselves too unusual to get the girl doomed to unrequited love and by extension doomed to a form of purity. Um, I should also mention there was a preoccupation with uh, straight edge rhetoric in third wave emo, sort of divorced from its hardcore roots, um, which I kind of see now as sort of convenient branding if you're a young person intimidated by like sex and drugs, you could just always say I'm straight edge. Um, all of those readings are of heteronormative virginity um, or purity refute any real autonomy for women involved and they're also really antiquated, but so is abstinence only education. Um, I'd argue that conversations surrounding the purity movement ended in the early 2010s or potentially before when teen pop stars at the forefront physically removed their rings. But for Christian message, uh, for, but Christian messaging persists, especially in emo and pop punk, where many Christian groups have either sort of continued on performing for a loyal audience or they've leaned into Christian performance <laughs> even more explicitly, um, like Reliant K who've won Grammys in the genre. As veiled Christian rhetoric continues to be propagated through emo and pop punk music, uh, that if it continues to find an audience, evangelical messaging, of course, will operate in secular spaces. Um, but this music isn't as popular as it once was, um, and obsessive conversations surrounding virginity and purity don't seem to have the same mainstream popularity. You probably get cast aside for slut shaming rhetoric. And I think that's a really good thing because no one deserves to walk into a youth group and see a banner that says something along the lines of skankity, not skank itty. Thank you. Awesome. awesome. Thank you, Maria. That was, that was great. And I have a feeling this Q and A is gonna be pretty lit. So, um, wow. Uh, <laughs> My notes, my notes. Okay, so we have uh, Brittany Spanos on deck here uh, with Brown Sugar, Black Girls, Media Language, and the Maturity Curve in Pop. Take it away, Brittany. Cool. Can you guys see my, my screen? Awesome, okay. Um, hi guys, thank you so much for having me. Um, incredible talks from Allison and Maria, per usual. Um, and I'm so happy to be back doing PopCon. Um, I'm doing kind of a, a critical essay version of, the t of my talk to kind of expand a portion of a definition that I want to get into, and I'll explain that more as I get into this. Um, Beyonce Knowles is only three months older than Britney Spears. Even when they were just teens at the turn of the century, their sexual expressions and physical desirability were well dissected and often grossly celebrated on vastly different terms. Though neither young woman had much ownership over how their bodies, dancing, and songs were perceived, the two were clearly playing in separate public forums. While the white Southern Spears was a virginal flower who needed to be protected, her appeal through the male gaze was often taboo. Meanwhile, the black Southern Knowles was more openly fetishized and often celebrated for being able to hold back her also virginal sexuality to an appropriate degree. This isn't unique to Bay and Brit. Black and brown female bodies are often treated like they exist on a maturity curve, 
where the taboo of their burgeoning sexuality is seen as a less controversial public topic of conversation. This plays out in the private sphere as well, often leading us to ponder the ways in which we have failed young women who do not have the luck of bearing white skin. When I first pitched this paper, I wanted to do a critical media study examining the differences in language and expectations for various black and POC stars, in contrast to their white peers in competition throughout the last few decades of popular music. For the redacted version, I want to instead build out the definition of the maturity curve and how it further exemplifies the radically different ways in which whiteness is favored and at least attempted to be protected in music, though in the end, the industry continues to fail women in totality. I want to start by how we talk about female sexuality in pop music. The biggest, most looming question is often, who is this for? The term sex sells is often thrown around first as a way of explaining popular marketing strategies, and has, as years have progressed, it has been used to diminish the work of women whose bodies become a part of their art and performance. Of course, there are countless times throughout history when labels, managers, photographers, and journalists have taken advantage of a female pop star's body in both tangible and less tangible forms. Even when they are performing for a young, predominantly female audience, they are still seen as both serving and amplifying the male gaze. Still, in pop music, the body has also become the greatest symbol of control. Madonna writhing on the VMA floor during Like a Virgin, Janet Jackson cooing about sexual ple pleasure on the self-titled Janet, Christina Aguilera and Britney Spears' sweaty, low-rise entries into adulthood. For all young artists who grew up in the spotlight, there has been a time and place for them to flip the script on, on substance versus sexuality debates in order to be seen as an adult star. Besides, is there anything more substantial than owning and expressing your own agency? Coming-of-age albums and accompanying live performances have become the primary source for all former teen stars, male or female, who aspire to showcase the ways in which they've grown. Cis, straight male teen idols often use this type of album to alienate their often young female fan base, a fake barometer of artistry. For all white or white-passing teen stars, this is a great way to be relinquished from all that tethers them to their safe, youth-appealing past while exhibiting varying degrees of power over their career. To do so, they provoke through both their physicality as well as by aligning with respectable black made genres like blues rock, R&B, and hip hop. This allows them to seemingly remove themselves from the teams of people who crafted their pop identity for them. Transitional albums, as I like to refer to these coming of age musical moments, are important because they reveal the intricacies of our generational definitions of both childhood and adulthood. They reflect the way we mature as well as redefine those boundaries for us. Transitional albums are more than just moving away from teen pop. In a broader sense, they are about proving artistry, maybe even genius, and establishing a career that can be long-term rather than a short-lived obsession with a very talented youngin. In the same way that teen pop helps underage audiences, specifically female or femme listeners, establish the desires they have when it comes to things like sexuality and emotions, transitioning away from teen pop helps those same kids negotiate their desires by, for, or against them. A successful transitional album is a complete, complete 180 from their past that brings an artist into their future, a metaphoric loss of artistic virginity meant to evoke the less metaphoric kind of virginity. Teen pop stars show us cracks in the gleaming manufactured veneer of who they were as if to signal, see, you thought you knew me, but you didn't. They do so through exposing what was hidden. Justin Timberlake revealed the sexual indiscretions and betrayal by Britney. Christina Aguilera became candid about her troubled home life as a child. They free themselves in different ways, with male artists emphasizing excess and vice, while female artists enact control over physicality and self-image. This is as important for artistic credibility as any sound they adopt. No one wants to hear the grown-up work of a perfectly groomed child. Of course, it should be moderately successful. Miley Cyrus's Can't Be Tamed was her first attempt to establish herself as an edgy bad girl in music, but the rock sound came, rock sound came off as childish and was a commercial failure. Yet, when she returned three years later with Bangers, Miley had completely peeled away any signs of her Disney past, with minstrel-laden hip-hop influences and imagery, and used the shock value of her legality to enter a new period of her life and career. Bangers proposes the fatal flaw of the transitional album, and how it is more specifically rooted in aiding the future canonization of white stars. Cyrus heavily utilized black producers, black featured artists, black slang, black dancers, black dance moves, in order to essentially black out her Disney history. Her weaponization of blackness as a way of proving maturity was not new and has since been repeated by other artists. Still, it poses one very rhetorical question. If blackness equates adulthood and pop music, where does that leave the black youth in the industry? For young black artists, specifically young black women, many are left with the impossible task of growing up in an industry that has seen them as grown since the minute they entered, no matter how young. The constant appropriation and whitewashing of black culture, the very root of popular music, 
um, further establishes that a, fem a black female body is at default sexual, old enough, and consenting. She is a body that is tough, willing, and able to fend for herself. She is a body that does not need protection, no matter how vulnerable she may actually be. Just a couple months after Miley released Bangers, Beyonce released her self-titled album. It was a groundbreaking release for many reasons. Leading with digital first, it led the way in breaking the traditional album rollout as music listeners became more dependent upon streaming services over buying physical media. Accompanying it was a visual album, also unique given the waning influence of MTV and the very notion of music videos as serving a greater purpose than further amping up single streaming numbers. Beyonce, the album, also proved that Beyonce, the artist, was one of music's most dominant forces, especially coming off the less than stellar, by Beyonce standards, sales of her previous album for. More than anything, however, Beyonce, the album, felt like a delayed coming of age. At 32 years old, listeners and critics were finally seeing Beyonce as the type of artist who was absolutely in charge of her own destiny, instead of, say, a puppet of her own father or an industry obsessed with fetishizing bodies that move and look like hers. It's the type of coming-of-age statement that her white and white-passing contemporaries of the late 90s and early aughts made a decade prior, one where she no longer had to play a careful balancing act of both being sexually appealing while reinforcing, reinforcing puritanical traditional ideals of love and matrimony. The story of marriage, she told, was one that was as erotic as it was emotionally messy, paving the path for the more brutally honest lemonade a couple years later. These realities explode beyond the parameters of pop music. What pop music does instead is put a mirror to those societal truths, ones that refuse to see young black women as vulnerable, question their pain and interrogate their very existence, while letting them remain the blueprint for all that is good and righteous and fun in culture. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Brittany, that was great. So if we can get back to the group here. Um, so we have, um, yeah, we have some, we have a good, at least uh, 13 minutes for Q&A. And um, I think there was one question here from Rebecca Rinsema. Oh yeah, so um, Robert also mentioned that once we get into the Q&A, people will have, um, the ability to unmute themselves to ask that question. But I'll just take the question here from the chat. There's a lot to be said here about Christians sort of remaining children always, God's children, and never really growing up. Is that same, the same for emo fans? So Rebecca, I don't know if you were posing that to the group or to Maria. I think you asked that question during that, during her presentation, Maria's presentation. Yeah, that's... Oh. Yeah, I suppose it's... Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah, I suppose it's to um, to the group or whoever wants to take it, but um, I speak from sort of like personal experience here about sort of like the idea of remaining God's child and um, sort of this personal relationship that is, you know, so heavily prevalent in Christian circles and they all sort of link up to um, this idea of remaining in this adolescent phase. So, um, so I want to hear more about that. Yeah, that's, that's a fascinating question. And like, I have a couple of immediate thoughts. And it also, if you have personal experience, you want to speak to directly, I would, I would love to hear more about that. But um, there, that sort of um, arrested state of like childhood or adolescence, there obviously there is a parallel there that I'm kind of now kicking myself for, for not outlining further. Um, and with the idea of God's children, I imagine it's to remain pure, the sort of, the, there's nothing more innocent than a child ideology. However, maybe there is a bit of difference with emo fans because it is so tethered, I think, to adolescence. And I think that's, you know, tethered to puberty and, and the sort of beginning of um, any sort of like sexual identity formation. Um, and perhaps maybe that's why Christian emo was so effective because it kind of places a stop there a little bit. Um, and I, I will say that just in sort of my own personal experience, I've noticed that like some of the adult emo fans that I come in contact, and of course I'm also part of this um, contingency uh, or this group of people mm -hmm. rather, um, Christian emo fans tend to be, still be loyal to the sort of Christian emo that they grew up with. And I wonder mm -hmm. if that is related to that idea of um, maintaining that, that childhood um, spirit. Um, but yeah, if, if you have any personal thoughts, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, so in some ways, like it's sort of about the purity or like striving for purity. Um, but also this idea of like, you know, sort of, there's a lot of navel gazing that's associated with, you know, especially um, being part of the church groups that you talked about. Um, and that sort of navel gazing sort of like continues on sort of indefinitely 
in um, sort of the Christian religion. <laughs> so this personal journey, all of these different kinds of things. So, um, and I think like you've already said, they're sort of like, that sort of continues to a degree with the emo mm -hmm. fan base as well. So, cool. so thank thanks. You. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, anybody else have questions for Allison or Brittany? We have a good 10 minutes, so. Um, well, I have a question. Allison, you know, as you were um, talking about the, um, the uh, initiative to get Tw Taylor Swift fans to write to their senators, I'm curious about the um, sort of any right wing blowback. Yeah, I mean, if you go under any of Taylor Swift's posts where she tweets anything vaguely progressive or at Donald Trump, it's fascinating seeing the responses so polarized in the sense that it's people being like, yeah, Taylor, I love you. Thank you so much. Like queen. And then people being like, my daughter is never seeing Taylor Swift in concert ever again. And it's like, is your daughter real? Like, are you just a right wing troll who's just like seeking out these, these opportunities to, to kind of, um, you know, post critically. Um, but yeah, I think, I think there is um, always going to be that kind of. Sure. Feedback. But what about right, right wing youth? Right wing news. Yeah. I, when I was looking, so I was looking for that because I was in the longer version wanted to talk a little bit more about um, about uh, criticisms of these. Um, and all of, or not all, I won't, I won't make a, a definitive statement saying all, but a lot of the, the comments that I was seeing were almost always parents um, speaking mm -hmm. on behalf of their children being like, I was going to take my whole family to see you and now I won't, or like my daughter's never listening to you again, um, which I don't totally know what that says about actual uh, youth, like right-wing youth criticism of that, um, but found to be kind of interesting, the, the role of, of parents speaking on behalf of, you know, could be actual children, could be, you know, my mom, if she were critical of that. Um, what is, what is it my child mean in that sense? Um, which is something that, I don't know, I think I thought a lot about with regard to the point of youth, like what does it mean to be a young fan? Um, I'm 26, so am I considered um, a young fan of, of Shawn Mendes or Taylor Swift, or is that relegated to, you know, teen and younger, um, which, yeah. Cool, thank you. All right. Oh, yes, um, Christine Capitola, please unmute Hi. yourself. Thank you, hi, yeah, I, I came in late, so I actually only caught um, Brittany's talk, and I wanted to say, Brittany, I really appreciate your work, and I teach it a lot in alternative journalism thank classes. You. <laughs> so thank you for that. Uh, I'm thinking a lot about Janet Jackson since there's another paper coming in a few hours from Joshua Chambers Letson about Rhythm Nation. I have an article coming out about control actually soon as well. Yeah. So maybe we can talk about how many times um, Janet has attempted to like get that kind of control over her career. And I think what you were saying about her being a black woman is, is something that ties in with that, but like the repeated yeah. attempts. I mean, I. Control. I think constantly about how the album control itself has been so influential and how a lot of teen pop stars have kind of mimicked it and thought about it as kind of the, the blueprint for how to reintroduce themselves to the world, especially with that album kind of being the moment that she was stepping out of her brother's shadow and kind of proving like, hey, I'm not like this like little girl who's around the Jackson 5 and like that can actually make hits and dance and perform at the same level and even better. and. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think constantly about how she has had to continue. I mean, Rhythm Nation was kind of like the substance, right? Like showing like I can like make this like politically conceptual album. And then an album like her self-titled was her reinventing herself as like, I am a grown woman. I can speak about sexual agency and I can like speak beyond empowerment and how she's continued to do that. And then still, you know, like looking decades later, kind of still get shamed for her body and be blacklisted for something that wasn't her fault at the Super Bowl and how, you know, it suddenly became like Janet's too provocative and Janet is like showing her skin. She needs to apologize. She is the one that sullied this football program. Like, you know, I think it's like definitely she has had to prove herself multiple times in a way that I, uh, many of her white peers have not had to prove themselves. And I think when you think of the way that you know, white and white passing pop stars have to, um, what they need to prove is that they can still make a hit 
they don't have to prove that they are in charge of their own body or in charge of like, you know, being, being an artist or things like that. They have to prove that like, I can still maintain like a top 10 hit or I can still fill a big arena. Like Janet's battle has been constantly not only maintaining an audience and maintain those hits, but also being respected um, for that agency and being respected for that. But yeah, I think she's def she's the blueprint for a lot of it. Um, and I mean, almost every artist who has done that sort of transitional album has cited her very specifically and has cited um, her influence more than more than anyone else. Thank you, Brittany. Um, anybody have any other questions or anybody? From Hannah Ewens in the chat. I was wondering, Allison, if in thinking about pop slash musicians slash political engagement, you've personally or academically got your own sort of pyramid of political engagement in pop in 2020 in your head. An example, if what Taylor does now is second tier effort slash stake, what's at the bottom up to the top? Oh yeah, um, thanks Hannah. Uh, so I, I was just talking about this earlier actually because something I was kind of wary of is that I didn't want to position what Taylor Swift is doing as like the be all end all of like pop like you know pop star politics right I think she's doing um she did nothing for a really long time and then uh started doing something which is posting about her politics pretty bare minimum um and you know offering fans ways to engage I think what she's doing is interesting in so much as it's extremely explicit about what she believes in and what she wants fans to do in response which is not so much the best thing that someone could do, but is particularly kind of rare among the biggest pop stars. I did my master's on Harry Styles' politics and how fans pushed him to, um, you know, reflect their own political values, particularly around Black Lives Matter. And kind of one of the biggest criticisms there is thinking about how pop stars like Harry and Sean use really kind of vaguely apolitical language to talk about progress and change and like the youth can do whatever they want. Um, so I think for me, like the explicitness of Taylor's politics, um, at least in so much as like saying the actual words and providing opportunities to do things is pretty interesting, um, if not like something quite good. Um, I think obviously like to the question, what's at the bottom up to the top? I think the bottom is obviously not doing anything. Um, I think that I've gone way past the point of, you know, wanting my um, pop stars to at least use their words to say what they believe. Um, but yeah, I don't, I think the thing about the, the Shawn Mendes thing, uh, the foundation and, and treat people with kindness with Harry Styles and so forth is, is quite the rhetorically, uh, vague, um, uh, middle ground of, of trying to get the, the clout for like being engaged, but not actually, um, doing anything very specific or making a, any kind of real claim, um, is quite low. But, um, of course this summer, um, seeing people say, you know, what your words are doing is kind of nothing unless you open your purse and give money was um, quite interesting, especially since, you know, with the Shawn Mendes Foundation, it's fans giving their own money, which Shawn Mendes give your own money. You have so much of it. So that's kind of how I think about it. Well, cool, thank you. And we do have a few questions um, in regards to Katy Perry's perceived failure with woke pop in the witness period but we have about um maybe a minute left so i'm wondering if maybe we can just uh um yield the floor to maria sherman talking a little an extension on the incel connection just because i feel like that's so um the zeitgeist right now yeah it's um it's it's certainly an idea and when i said that this was sort of work in progress thinking that's the idea it was sort of a late in writing this connection that i made because so much of what emo is and the reason that um, it's sort of evaluated critically now um, and retroactively as this really sort of damaging, sexist, misogynistic music is um, the embodiment of it, the lyricism of it was so hateful towards women. Um, they had no autonomy, which, which I touch upon there. And a lot of it was because they were doing something wrong or they were attracted to the wrong guy, which seems like very, like uh, a sort of obvious connection to sort of like Chad logic. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's certainly something that I need to dive in deeper, but it just, sure. it seems like if maybe, um, social media was as bad then as it was now, I could see like that radicalization happening sure. immediately. Um, sure. 
Yeah, and I then, mean, I wish we had, we, I wish we had more time uh, just to, to finish up that thought, but we have to wrap up. But this was incredible. What an incredible panel. What a great um, way to wake up uh, to day five. So thank you to Allison, to Maria, and to Brittany. Um, and uh, yeah, that was great. <laughs> thank you to all who were here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs>